Our next speaker this morning is Nancy Odegaard. Nancy is the head of preservation division at the Arizona State Museum on the campus of the University of Arizona and is a professor with the Department of Material Science and Engineering, the School of Anthropology, and the Drachman Institute. She leads the museum's efforts to preserve the collections of the museums through loans, exhibits, excavations, research, storage, and repatriation. She teaches and mentors students, provides outreach services to archaeological projects, tribal museums, and cultural centers, conducts research related to conservation, and she has led major projects involving pottery, human marines, basketry, textiles, chemical characterization tests, and pesticide residues. Nancy studied art history for her BA, museum studies, and the conservation of anthropological collections for an MA, and resource, environment, and heritage science for a PhD. She continues to gain experience through collaborative projects with a wide variety of museums and actively participates in professional organizations. She and her deceased colleague, Dr. Werner Zimt, began looking into CO2 ice after working with supercritical CO2 as a potential method for pesticide removal. Their work with cleaning basketry began in 2012 while working on items from the Save America's Treasure grant. Please welcome Nancy. Well, thank you for the invitation to be at this conference. I'm expecting to learn a lot and hopefully can share some information as well. Um, as mentioned, I was introduced to the idea of CO2 cleaning by Dr. Werner Zimt, who passed away last year after working with me for almost 30 years. Um, in 2007, we were working on sort of novel ideas for removing pesticides, and we had already been working with, um, on an experimental basis with supercritical CO2 under an NCPTT grant. Um, Werner remembered that liquid CO2 was being used to clean telescope mirrors at the University of Arizona, which is a, a big center for astronomy and wondered if we might try that working with, um, as a technique for dry pesticide removal on museum object surfaces. Um, the astronomers were, uh, and the people working with the telescopes, basically the mirror engineers, were using the technique um, to overcome scratching and fracturing uh, that was po happened with other methods. Um, we considered a number of gases um, and the use of ice pellets as cleaning possibilities. Um, we really liked the idea that micron-sized snow particles could transfer and displace particles um, of surface soiling. And we understood that as liquid CO2 expands at a high velocity, it could surround particles with kind of an envelope and then slide over a surface and then volatilize into the air. Um, this sort of has been talked about, this momentum uh, transfer and displacement system um, really seems to be this dry, non-conductive, non-abrasive, and non-toxic method. So we were pretty excited about it and um, decided to think about it some more. Um, Werner knew uh, Stu Honig. Um, who was mentioned earlier as a retired professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Arizona. And he had really been key in, uh, in his involvement in introducing the technology of cleaning of the astronomical mirrors um, in the 1980s. Um, Stu agreed to come over to the uh, conservation lab and let us borrow his portable tank and his nozzle. Um, unfortunately, his nozzle was broken, and um, Stu's cognitive abilities were, were failing, so we, we did not have further meetings. Um, I was really interested because, as mentioned, we were beginning to start a large basketry project that would involve over 30,000 specimens, and was interested in how we could think about particulate museum dust removal um, in new ways. Um, we had been working on a large pottery move and rehousing project for several years, and there were aspects um, 
a traditional brush and brush and vac cleaning. That's why the pot is up there in the in the picture. Um, that were a bit undesirable. That sort of pushing it along aspect um, was a little was considered a concern. So we proceeded by attaching our stainless steel braided hose and creating a kind of a simple plastic pipette tip and trying it out on some non-museum objects. Um, as pictured there, we, it was a bit crude, um, and we kind of used the directional nozzle and played with it in varying degrees and had some success um, that we were trying to understand what was successful and not successful, basically trial and error. Um, the, we really didn't fully understand what was happening uh, at those beginning stages. And so the comments that it's experimental and you have to try is pretty much our experience as well. But this is um, inert, uh, gentle, colorless, odorless. Um, it was cheap and it was easily available for us. So there were a lot of reasons to continue. Um, we had an idea um, of how we might go about it and um, we created an area that was well ventilated, well lighted. Um, we had a dust collector from our old SS White uh, air abrasive unit that was we could set up on the side. And we ordered uh, liquid uh, CO2 with a siphon or a dip tube um, because we had been talking with Stu and you know moving along in that direction. I don't remember thinking about the quality of the gas at that time. It didn't occur to me. That's something that I'd like to hear more about because I think, I think that is potentially um, a concern. But museum dust is something I think everybody in the room is, has some familiarity with. So after uh, some initial successful examples, we sought a new nozzle and learned that, I learned that, that Hugh had um, also purchased um, nozzles and was working with this and was cleaning, actively cleaning museum objects. And I was able to come to Washington and meet with Hugh and see the SI equipment and the setup. And uh, was very impressed with his dual gas nozzle that introduced nitrogen. Um, I had not, prior to the visit, had heard his 2009 uh, talk to AIC uh, and the, the postprints had not been printed yet, but he graciously shared with me the pre-publication copy, and um, you know that was also confidence to keep going. So we did end up using the technique on many of the 500 baskets uh, selected for a 2012 exhibition um, that kicked off our Save America's Treasure project um, that otherwise was dealing with um, a very large collection. So as we spoke, um, I did not find the condensation to be a significant problem and went back and thought about that some more. And that's really because our relative humidity in Tucson, Arizona <laughs> is a little closer to 25 to 30% ambient on a good day and can be much lower than that um, as well. So I believe that we were having these initial good results because we were mostly trying to remove desert dry particulates. Um, our basketry surfaces did have a structural stability, um, and many actually have a cuticle or a bark layer uh, present. Um, our surface temperatures of our basketry and textile fibers were not really thermally conductive, um, so we weren't, the, we weren't gonna see the things that metals and glass often do. And it, it really did appear through testing that our um, surfaces were able to withstand the force of the jet. So thinking of gold as a soft material, I, basketry is even softer. Um, and we didn't see, I did not and have not seen a lot of absorption of the snow particles or redeposition uh, issues. So that said, I, I really, um, other projects on our calendar and really my own uncertainty on how to make museum dust, to quantify this application, to, its remo to dust removal, or how to really report my thoughts on this technique really kept me, kept me away from it uh, for a couple years here. And the other issue was that I really found that it seemed like there were 
different personalities to the tanks. And I couldn't really logically explain that, except now I think that there may be contamination in my tanks and that my tanks could have been a little bit different. So I'd like to hear more about that. I'm going to describe um, in the next slides the testing method I used to sort of evaluate how I was using the technique. So first I uh, purchased a hat, basketry hat from uh, Ikea and I proceeded to cut it up into 13 pieces. I used a sewing machine to secure the plated weave structure so I wouldn't have that falling apart on me. I roughened up the surface with a sanding grit and then I cleaned that off with compressed air. Um, my pieces were all labeled with a numbering system with a Sharpie pen uh, to indicate the piece side and the location of four circles that I had uh, included on each piece. Um, each piece was photographed under identical conditions of position and lighting, you know, using a copy stand and Barrelux lighting daylight bulbs. Um, we used a dyno light to take micro photographs of each circle throughout all the stages. Um, we kept the setup in place and didn't move it during the whole uh, testing sequence. A recipe of known components for synthetic or artificial dust was adapted to reflect the particulate and fiber fractions found in what I considered museum dust. There's a patent article out there dated in 2001 um, titled Artificial Dust Comp Composition and Methods of Manufacture that I found really useful. And um, I gathered the raw materials and prepared them to suitable fineness and volume. So it was necessary, for example, to collect plant material and bake it and then grind it with a mortar and pestle and um, sieve it. It was natural and synthetic fibers were needed um, to be cut and I used Sokola flock cellulose fiber from a jar. Skin was particularly difficult to obtain uh, enough, so using uh, human heel skin was precious little, actually. Uh, so a rawhide from a cow skin was uh, added, and finally rabbit skin glue in a jar was <laughs> completed the necessary volume. Um, the particulate components of talc and starch and carbon were relatively easy to select and measure from jars. Um, I used a number 10 standard test sieve uh, to reduce the particle size for many of the components. So here you can see us doing that. Uh, the components were assembled and mixed in a geological lab blender, uh, published particulate sizes for dust, which is a little hard to find, I found, um, suggest that you know, less than 10% are under 75 microns, 10 to 20% are between 75 and 300 microns, and 60 to 80% are, are over 300 microns in size. Most of the components in our artificial dust were less than 100 microns. Um, so in a museum environment, we all probably know this, it's less likely to have really large particles traveling around. Um, if they come into the museum with people, they tend to fall on the floor. So objects on shelves or in open displays, I think uh, generally have less. But I did read an earlier article that suggested that an annual accumula accumulation of about 1.3 grams per square meter um, is not uncommon in a museum. So for distribution of my dust um, onto uh, the samples, I looked at an ASTM uh, standard for accelerated soiling of pile yarn floor coverings as uh, something to consider. And I used a Tupperware saltine cracker container as a tumbler. Um, for each sample, I used five grams of artificial dust that was measured by weight in the tumbler, and the, tum the samples were tumbled for two minutes, a minute forward and a minute backwards. We were interested in what the mixture of our dust looked like chemically. Uh, FTIR identified only the larger components of the inorganic clays and the organic cellulose. 
Um, our dust did compare similarly to other compositional studies of household dust. And what you don't see is a lot of the smaller things, particularly um, the fibers and the protein material. Uh, we used FTIR to compare samples of household vacuum dust, which collected from my house, and with our artificial dust. And as expected, there's a little more protein in the household dust than in ours. But again, I was looking at what people had said about museum dust, where you expect more uh, construction material dust, um, or at least that's the idea. Um, weights were taken of each sample at each phase of the testing. Uh, first, prior to the addition of dust, second, after the addition of the dust, and um, after cleaning, finally. We were using a Mettler balance and had to construct a little, a little boat with sides um, to, to get, get the weights um, standardized. So using a tear, and there you see the tumbler um, action. That was human, um, assistant Wendy worked on that, and a little stand to keep them uh, separated. But that's kind of how we set it up. Um, I considered accelerated aging strategies. Um, I think we all know like dusty surfaces that have experienced some kind of moisture event um, can be harder to clean. Uh, I guess the dust is more like, you know, it's gone to mud and then re uh, attached itself. So I opted to humidify in an environment of over 99% for about eight hours in a glove box and the um, samples were placed above uh, containers with deionized water and then we kind of monitored the environment and it was a good way to check our meters which were aging and so we were roughly around 99% um, much most of the time. Uh, Following the humidification, uh, a lab oven was used to dry the samples at about 99C for about 20 hours. This was to kind of create a, a shock. The dusted and slightly aged samples were documented photographically and with the micro and macro imaging. Um, each was half covered with aluminum foil. What I wanted was that half clean, half not clean um, ability to see. So one sample of, they were randomly assigned to different cleaning procedures. We compared brushing, brush vacuuming, and the CO2 snow. One sample of plain basketry and one sample of basketry with textile, there was a hat band, you may have noticed, um, were each assigned to brush and brush vacuuming techniques. And a control sample had been selected previously and kept isolated from all the samples throughout the process. A control sample was also subjected to accelerated aging by the humidity and heat, but was not dusted. And uh, we decided that sample number one uh, would be maintained as a, a kind of our experimental um, specimen that we could work out handling, weighing, camera setup, and issues that had to do with a fair amount of jostling and moving. And the remainder samples were all used for the CO2 testing because we wanted to try to average our results. So the cleaning methods for brushing and brush vacuuming followed what we consider sort of standard techniques in the lab. The brushes we like to use with basketry are fan-shaped nylon blender artist brushes. Um, and you can see just sort of brushing it away from you on, onto the counter. Nice, it was black counter. Um, and the brush vac um, technique, uh, we, we use a kind of a medium suction on a, a dental vacuum and that collects the dust in a wet chamber that you can see below. And this, this was uh, examined after we did it, but uh, was not filtered at this time because we knew what the dust was. Um, but it generally appeared of a similar quantity to that that was on the counter. I mean, so visually we thought they were, the brush vac was removing somewhat similar amounts of dust as the brushing alone. Um, the CO2 cleaning method was uh, the same as what we had used in our trials. Um, we didn't really play with the pressure too much. We have the, the gauge and it just sort of stays. It goes up 
or closer to 60. Um, the distance was, typically we work about six to 10 inches away. Um, we do turn on a dust collector right near where we're working. Um, and in my experience, um, kind of quick strokes with the nozzle work best for cleaning and that you kind of follow a direction towards your extraction area. So you kind of work away from yourself um, generally. You can see our setup. Um, after going through all this, the uh, samples, um, the aluminum foil was removed and we took the um, macro photographs and you can kind of, I think, maybe make out uh, here where it's kind of half and half. And then we proceeded, once we had taken all those pictures, we proceeded to clean the entire piece. So all the areas that had been under foil were then uh, cleaned off so we could check our weights. So here's what we kind of have. Um, the weights were taken again, and we added them to an Excel spreadsheet so we could really collect the data. So what you're looking at is a mass removed using the different techniques. The basketry and the basketry with the, with the textile were a little bit different. And then the, we had started taking uh, account of the time using a telephone stopwatch. Where did that go? Um, well, we're missing tables, um, sadly. Um, so I have a table <laughs> that didn't show up here. Uh, that um, It was just like the similar data. It's just done with a bar chart. And what it really shows is that the percentage of dust removal, so maybe what I'll do is just go back here, um, is when we're talking about the, the brushing, we're like 40 to 50% removal of what we had put on. And when we're talking about brush and vacuuming, it is a little better, but it's like 50 to 54%. And with the CO2, I mean, the highest one I had was about 85% removal. So we're going from 75 to 85. So that, that's substantial. Um, the amount of time, it takes a little longer the more layers you have, so the, the seconds involved with these samples, and I brought them, people are curious, but they're about this big, um, uh, uh, means that it's, it's pretty fast. So what, what my tables that didn't come across um, in Dropbox uh, show is, is just that. We did go back and use um, FTIR, to look at kind of a before and after. Um, we looked at, uh, the, you know, compared the, the control that hadn't had anything and then the cleaned uh, surfaces. Um, and we can see that there is still some of the dust present, um, but, it's, but it's smaller, um, definitely. But a complete removal does not, I, that was not our experience. I want to just show some of the examples, not all of the samples that we have. So again, kind of we took all the 13 and randomly assigned them. So this is uh, the, the macro photographs of the before with the weight and the during and the after. And then you can see the amount of, of dust removed. Um, these are the close-up pictures then of that same sample, the arrows pointing to the, the circle. And these circles, as I said, were with Sharpie. So you have um, the before picture and um, the dust, artificially dusted, and the after. So in the case here was interesting, our brush technique um, really caught a lot of the organic fiber um, in the stitching. But there wasn't, um, I didn't see a whole lot of you know, surface damage to uh, what we were curious about, these, this, this kind of damage would have been what I inflicted on areas of the piece. And then afterwards, there's really not much change. So that was pretty uh, interesting. Uh, and then going on to samples that had both the textile and the basketry. And um, here you can see uh, really very well. Um, now you can also see that it doesn't remove Sharpie. <laughs> um, there is a little bit of a, you know, fiber movement 
um, here. So there's like, but most of the cracks and the scratches um, and differential on the, on the textile is, is very much the same to what was there before. Um, this was with the brush and vac. And uh, again, kind of focusing on one of the, the circles um, where we could include both. And here you can kind of see, I think, the before and after and then with the, with the dust. Um, so it's um, an improvement. And uh, this is with the CO2. So here we have the, the general, um, and I didn't point out before, but I'm sure you saw this was the photo with the half where the foil would have been covering it. And then the close-up, um, and there's a substantial uh, improvement over brushing and brush and vacuuming, and luckily not much damage or change to the fiber. And then this is the back side of that same piece um, where we looked at, and again, there's still little where it can get caught up in a uh, uneven surface would be something to consider and one would want to want to test. Perfect. Um, so now just a few slides of just kind of what we were experimenting with over the last couple of years and seeing. Um, you can see this is kind of a half done. This would be a typical example of the cleaned and the uncleaned using, um, even in a very three-dimensional shape. Um, here, sort of a cleaned area and uncleaned. And this would be kind of the setup. And this one's really dramatic. This is a, actually a really important piece. And a little disclosure that here's our, our extractor um, to the dust collector. But in working with this, um, I could use this as a preliminary technique. And then I went back and kind of used other false small tools and looked at some of the areas again, because there's, there's more than just particulate dust on this basket. Um, and I wanted to be sure there wasn't kind of ethnographic use deposits. Um, but I was able to kind of consider it this, like, give it a burst, clean, come back with something else, then go back again, much as, as Hugh was talking about, that you kind of work through this and um, sort of see. This was a, a very early example. And this, this was, we, it, we've now found it was a museum piece that had fallen behind a cabinet. Um, but at the time, it was considered a, they didn't know it. We actually found the number because of the CO2 cleaning. But it, um, it, it was made by an anthropologist, and so it was a, that person had some notoriety, so it became important. But looking at it, it's really along this margin. This is what's been cleaned. And this is paint um, on, on the textile, and this is unclean, so it's pretty subtle. And then just in the background, you can see it's, it's really much brighter. Um, this was really pretty experimental, and that idea of how can you support the object, this took at two people. We kind of had to work with so somebody holding and then an operator and kind of work our way through. So there are some issues, but this, this would have been very, very difficult to clean. I mean, it, had, it went through vacuuming, and it's, it, the CO2 was, was far more, as a second process, was far more effective. Um, we worried a little bit about dry pigments, um, or, or what we, matte pigments, I guess I would say, because there is a little bit of binder. Um, in this uh, keyhole, which is a kind of a net backpack made of agave fiber, but along this margin here, this would have been cleaned, and it's still kind of dusty. Um, for, for me, I kind of put my extractor, and I, I usually wear a particle mask, because um, especially with three-dimensional objects, and um, move along, kind of trying to work towards, encourage the particles to go towards the extractor. And this is uh, birch bark with porcupine quill and stitching, um, essentially a, a, a before, uh, this is a cleaned area in here, and then after. So these two, I think, show what's, what's really kind of possible. And I'd like to just acknowledge a lot of the people who have been in my lab and sort of helped uh, play with this, as well as offer some real constructive um, suggestions as we went along. Thank you.
Thank you. We're going to um, pass on questions now for the sake of time uh, and return to questions in our panel discussion. Our next speaker is Rosemarin van der Molen. Rosemarin obtained her Bachelor of Arts in 2005 from the Herit Reitfeld Academy in Amsterdam. She then studied conservation of historic and ancient metals at the Cultural Heritage Agency, known as RCE now, formerly ICN, graduating in 2009. She has graduated from the Master's Program in Conservation at the University of Amsterdam in 2010 while working as a metals conservator in private practice, working on the conservation team for a heavily damaged Rodin thinker. She then worked at Tate, London, as an assistant sculpture conservator and sculpture for nearly five years. Rose Marin has just, within days, moved to Houston, where she will be working in private practice. So please welcome our new colleague to the United States, Rose Marin. Thank you. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. I would firstly like to thank the organizers of today for inviting me to talk here about my research on the cleaning of metals. And I hope you will find at least some of what I'm about to tell you useful or at the very least interesting. My talk today is mostly based on my master's graduation research, which I carried out back in 2009 at the National Heritage Board of the Netherlands in cooperation with the University of Amsterdam. Um, my thesis was written in Dutch, but the results were published in condensed form in 2010 as part of the Metals, the ICOM Metals CC uh, Conservation Conference proceedings. So you'll be able to read up all the details there. Um, firstly, I'd also like to thank my supervisors and co-authors for that paper. Uh, for all their help at the time and their support. Um, yeah, so dry ice blasting on metals. Today I will first just briefly discuss the background and the setup of my research. And the main focus was to establish if dry ice blasting was a feasible uh, replacement for solvents for the removal of organic layers from metal objects. Um, I decided to leave all the graphs out today and just show you as many photos as I can fit into the time of the actual cleaning uh, test. And of course, I'll discuss the outcomes of my research and its conclusions. Um, the, the reason I chose dry ice blasting for my master thesis was basically the fact that we didn't know anything about it at the time. We weren't aware of Hughes' um, experiments over here. And uh, there hadn't been any conservation publications on its use on metals. And uh, it was in fact my tutor, Tony Benches, who suggested it. And I thought it was very interesting to look at something that we just had no idea about. Um, because in industry, the, the um, technique is often used for the removal of organic layers, as, we, as we've already seen discussed this morning. And also because of its advertised non-abrasive qualities, I really focused it, my research on the replace, it being a replacement of solvents. And here you see the main research question. And then, because I had to narrow it down slightly, of course, <laughs> I mostly focused on its use uh, for possibly the removal of graffiti and wax from metal outdoor sculptures. And that, that led all my samples and the layers that I um, applied. Um, yeah, many sources that I came across at the beginning of my research, they all stressed the fact that dry ice blasting would be non-abrasive. And when I was designing my tests, I really had that in mind. And looking back, some of the layers are probably more friable than um, you would want to use dry ice on. Um, I also, you also used the word magic. I, I, th I guess I thought it would be a magic technique where dry ice could go into little crevices, it would expand and somehow magically transport paint out of, for example, graffiti on weathering steel. We will see um, what happened in reality. Um, 
So that also meant that the research kind of shifted a little bit towards the removal of inorganic layers as well as organic layers. Right, so, oh. So for my samples, I chose a couple of different metals which you might find on outdoor sculptures, such as aluminium, or I'll learn to say aluminum from now on. <laughs> Um, bronze, patinated bronze, and weathering steel. For the, um, the patination of the bronze, I, I used um, uh, copper nitrate in two layers. So there was a base layer, which we heated so far that it, it was quite a um, dense black layer. And then the second layer of uh, patination was green. And the total thickness you can see here was between 35 and 60 micron. Then the weathering steel, um, was supplied by an art, <coughs> excuse me, hmm. was supplied by an art manufacturing company and this was um, a pedestal which had been outdoors for six months so it had had a good number of drying and wetting cycles to build up a cor corrosion layer although not that thick but pretty good nonetheless. Um, I, of course, documented all the samples by photography, um, both with normal camera and through optical microscope. Then, when I was looking at the technique, I mostly came across um, liquid dry ice, dry snow blasting machines, which had to be used at very high pressure. So I quite soon turned to um, solid carbon dioxide blasting. And it's important to point out, though, that dry ice is harder than um, the carbon dioxide snow. Uh, it's basically made in the same way by expanding <clears throat> liquid carbon dioxide. It cools down, it becomes a solid, but it then gets compressed, and you can, you can buy it in pellet size. There's different sizes of pellets or blocks. And that's the um, application I ended up using. Um, I chose... I chose the machine that I used because it was adjustable from very low blasting pressures to pressures of eight bar, which the, the liquid dry snow blasting machines had to be used at a, a higher pressure, at least the ones that I found um, at the time of my research. Uh, so there we go, there it is. Um, the i3 MicroClean by ColdJet is a one hose dry ice blasting machine of tabletop size, and you can see here's the block. It goes through a shaving mechanism which takes off sugar grain-sized particles, which are then propelled into the nozzle through a hose, of course, with um, pressurized air. I used the standard hose length of 3.7 meters and um, a Laval nozzle, which is a, has a rectangular opening of about, it was nine and a half millimeters wide, so a medium-sized nozzle, maybe. And this is all the other nozzles that were available to use for that machine. So it, it's quite a flexible setup. Right, then um, for my first test, um, this first test was, was mostly meant to get an idea of what would happen to my sample surfaces um, at different blasting pressures, as because with any blasting technique, your particle speed is probably your main parameters, and that's set by blasting pressure. Although not exactly linearly. <laughs> um, I chose the parameters for this set also to be able to compare it to other blasting techniques, but I should say that it's almost impossible to compare because so many other factors come into play, such as host length, the age of your dry eyes, your particle size, which could vary, um, the humidity, etc. Um, so for this test, it was pretty simple. Um, just clamped um, the nozzle. Every, every one of my test plates had a hole in the middle so that I could attach this template on the top, which had a little window, and I could just move it around, blast one area at a time, and uh, yeah, that worked pretty well. For this test, I used average settings of this machine, so it was 
0.18 kilos per minute of dry ice, a blasting angle of 90 degrees, and the distance was five centimeters. And I was using a blasting time of one minute. And then, yeah, looking at some of the results. So unpatinated bronze, already the first test scared me a little because I hadn't expected my corrosion layer or my pat patina layer to come off. Um, this said it was, in fact, I was so scared I only used 30 seconds instead of the 60 seconds that I was supposed to use. Uh, but it's much the same uh, results. So that's one and a half bar, four bar, seven bar. And a close-up of the area blasted at seven bar. And you can see the top layer is completely removed. And in the middle of the blasted area, you can see the bare metal. Um, however, um, I then took a cross-section of this area. And under SEM at, at about 370 or 300 times um, enlargement, you... This is the area outside of where it, the sample was blasted. You can see the black layer and the thicker green layer here. And I, I'm inclined to say that here you don't see any surface damage on the substrate because there's a little bit of patina left almost everywhere. So that was a, a comforting thing to see throughout. Then there was the aluminium, which was very soft. Um, Again, blasting, this time at 60 seconds, one and a half, four, and seven bar. Seven bar made the aluminium, well, it, it just looked very damaged already to the naked eye, and especially under the microscope. And uh, that's the parameters again. And then looking at cross-section, the area which hadn't been blasted, and you... <laughs> It looks pretty damaged. You can see uh, this huge crater and the material actually being displaced. And when looking from the top down, it's just all the same area. You can see the impact craters of where the particles touch the surface. Oh, Ineke Joosten carried out all the SEM imaging. Fan of her. Um, sorry, I'll just go back. So. That's the non-blasted area. You see that it came from the manufacturer with kind of lines on the surface which have been completely um, erased. Um, then, of course, the organic layers that I was keen to remove. Um, it was their turn. So this was the second test, which was a flexible test. Uh, you can see I'm wearing goggles, uh, glo one glove, and this, this uh, room will had uh, extraction. Um, so, for example, on, this was one of the patinated bronzes. I didn't um, impregnate the patina on this sample, so it was, just, it was the very um, kind of friable green layer, and then I applied black microcrystalline wax on top, and this was the result. This is a one five millimeter. Um, size line. So this is before application, this is after application of the black wax. And here you see that I couldn't remove all of the black wax without leaving the green layer intact, which that was my intention at the time. You could also say if your intention is to remove the wax and also the green layer, I could have been quite successful. So it does depend how you look at it as well. Uh, this is one of our um, test objects we had in the course. This was a really successful cleaning. It was a pewter candlestick, it had lots of old wax on it, and it only took about 20 seconds to get from this to that. And I was like, wow, brilliant. <laughs> um, so it, it really varied how it worked. It worked really well in this case. That's the weathering steel, excuse me. Oh yeah. So this sample had been outside for six months and I applied the pink sp spray paint, which was cellulose nitrate. Um, here you see a close up of the surface. Again, 
probably naively, but I thought this really didn't work very well. Um, because you, you can see you've cleaned all the way down through the orange layer, down to the black layer underneath, and there's still paint remaining, so yeah. That was interesting, good to know. <laughs> And then the aluminum, this was a very successful clean, which really made for a nice change. And it probably, this, I think it only took about 10 seconds to clean half of the plate. It was 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So it's quite small, but still, it was really quick. It came off really nicely. You didn't, to the naked eye, you couldn't really see any difference between the blasted area and the non-blasted area, although we will see later that there was a slight change in the surface. Again, um, a random object, a, a painted steel coat hanger. I applied a graffiti on there and this cleaned off pretty well. I, I could have continued to clean this area as well. It would have come off. Um, you see here, if you look at this area, there is a little bit of paint loss but that could be, depending on your object, that could be an acceptable amount. If you're in a rush, say you're trying to clean a, an, an enormous train which has graffiti all over it, that you know would save a lot of time and a lot of uh, scrubbing. Then to to try and make the the practical tests more comparable, I used similar parameters for a fixed set setup test as well. So the parameters in this test were based on the cleaning done in the previous handheld trials. Um, so the, the average setting that I used for this machine from the cleaning trials was to use quite a low uh, blasting pressure of one and a half bar. Although I also found I would have liked to use an even lower pressure, but um, the machine tended to clog up. So that was an, an issue that I, I came across. Um, so one and a half bar was about the lowest pressure that I could use that would still give a continuous stream of dry ice. Um, we used 45 degree angle, distance of 10 centimeters, so a little bit further away, and a mass flow rate of zero gram kilos per minute of dry ice. There was still dry ice coming out. Um, so on the, on the blank samples, the aluminum and the bronze, it was really hard to see any damage, but there still was a slight change in the surface, as you can see here, this is a shadow of the window in the template. So here's the area that's been blasted um, for five seconds at two bars. This test was actually done with a little bit more dry ice because it was related to the um, removal of the graffiti of the other sample. I hope that's somehow a little bit clear. <laughs> this is a close up again. So you can see the surface has roughened a tiny bit. Uh, then the bronze, pretty much the same story. You can see a very vague line here. A uh, little bit of roughening, maybe. There was some corrosion which we analyzed due to condensation. And yeah, so this is one of the kind of average setting ones on the patinated bronze. So we already know the green layer is really friable and I consider this quite a good result in that the, the bottom layer of patina is still completely intact after blasting for 30 seconds, which if you think about the cleaning speeds, 30 seconds is a long time to be blasting. It's basically you're forgetting that you've already cleaned the area and you're just stood there pointing at it, which I'm sure none of us would do. Um, this is the weathering steel, blasted for a whole minute. Again, we removed quite a lot of the corrosion. Not all of it, but still quite a lot of loss. So, oh, I should go back, sorry. Overall, the conclusion from the, the cleaning trials and the, the third fixed setup test was that the cleaning wasn't that successful on porous samples that I had prepared, um, but on the other hand, it did show that it was possible to gradually clean through the layers of corrosion or the patina in quite a controlled fashion. Um, so they were unsuccessful in my original mindset, but if that was your aim, then they were successful at removing those patina layers, for example. 
And then on the non-absorbent sub substrates, the cleaning was actually really successful. Though, I, <laughs> I would point out that removing the graffiti from the aluminium would have also been very quick and pretty simple using solvents. So that is a point where I'm not so sure it makes so much sense as a replacement. But we can talk about that. Um, then we also saw that in using parameters more similar to the cleaning parameters, there was actually much less damage to the layers I applied to the, the, the substrates um, than in the first test. So that was positive as well. I also tried um, flare to measure the temperature. This was on a very large object and I blasted on it for about three minutes. It was a steel pedestal and I got down to um, 7.2 degrees, so <laughs> only one degree lower than, than Hugh's test showed. Um, yeah, so in order to go to my conclusion, just wanted to quickly refer back to the three effects of dry ice blasting. Um, it, at the time, it was generally believed to work because of three effects, the mechanical effect, the thermal effect, and the sublimation effect. Um, my main source uh, was a PhD thesis by Martin Krieg, and he showed that the thermal effect was about 10% at room temperature and 50% at 500 degrees C. Now, we can't really go to 500 degrees C in conservation, um, but he did show that it was 20% thermal effect at 100 degrees, which for certain objects might be achievable. So there is a, there is a slight effect there. Um, the sublimation effect, he wasn't able to show that it exists, and I very much agree with you, what he said in his talk, that you are looking at a very soft air abrasive method with um, additional unique um, properties. So I'd say for our applications, the mechanical cleaning effect accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of your cleaning and possibly the thermal effect having an added, it's kind of a bonus. <laughs> um, so yeah, my test showed that dry ice blasting um, was very effective at removing organic layers from non-porous substrates, but there was some uh, mechanical damage. Uh, we saw the mechanical damage on aluminium, surface abrasion on the bronze, and the removal of corrosion from weathering steel. We also saw that it does depend on your um, parameters, and for example, blasting angle of 45 degrees makes a huge difference, which is something that is known from uh, research on air abrasive blasting anyway. Which is good because it means you can look at that research and use that to improve your parameters. Um, to use dry ice blasting um, as a replacement for solvents, to me at the time seemed limited to cases where slight abrasion is acceptable or where you can use dry ice blasting as a first step, maybe to remove very thick layers um, or on very hard substrates. Oh yeah, and it, I do think that there is applications where your organic layer is very susceptible to the cold and it, it, it would help to use dry ice blasting. And of course, if you look at it as an air abrasive method, it does compare really favorable to other methods because you don't have any blasting media to clean up. You're not embedding any of your media into your object. The dry ice is still a very soft medium, so it is one of the least abrasive methods around. I would like to thank all these people for their help, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rosemary. I'd like to invite the rest of our morning speakers up to join us at our panel here that is being illuminated. Um, we might raise the lights on the audience, too. Uh, while earlier I was asking you to get up to our standing microphones, uh, Abigail and Annie have kindly agreed to help uh, bring those microphones to you if you uh, raise your hand for a question.
Um, any questions to start? We have a microphone right here for you to use. Nancy, this is for you. Um, what was what equipment are you using in your sandblasting manufacturer's equipment? And the second question is, what was the material of the of the miniature teepee? Sorry, the last part. The material of the miniature teepee. Oh, okay. Um, well, the equipment we're using, we've sort of evolved a little bit. As I said, we we we've gone through a couple tanks. Um, and we are a little bit lucky I can order those on a university campus. Compressed gas is, is pretty easy to get. So, um, you know, we, we order it and it gets delivered. So the tank is one thing. We, we do have a nozzle from um, the, the company, Mr. Sherman's company, uh, that's kind of a simple, uh, just we, it's just that simple gun that was, was selected there that comes with the, the, the cable, and the, just as he illustrated. So we, that's what we're using at present. Um, the area, I have that old dust collector, and I just kind of set it up so that it's nearby. We did some earlier experiments inside a chamber, but the redeposition is sort of a problem inside a chamber, and a lot of other people have found that. So we, we, we don't really use that. We work out in the open. Um, so the, the gas and the nozzle, and I guess I use a Rubbermaid cart most of the time to put the objects on, um, and the gloves and mask. It's pretty much, pretty much it. Um, we, we try to set up with the photo. If we're gonna really try to watch what's happening, we have the photo set up going so that we can work for a few seconds and then go over and take pictures. But that's pretty much it. The little TP, it's about this high. It was a little model. It's cotton. It's just cotton fiber, cotton muslin, uh, sort of a medium grade. <laughs> uh, people that work with muslin in museums, it's not, it's not particularly heavy. And it, it was probably made in the 1930s. And the, one of the difficulties with it was that the little teepee sticks are glued and stitched in place. So it kind of collapses, but it's not possible to lay it out flat. So it's truly one of those difficult three-dimensional objects. Yeah, please. Uh, Nancy used our standard equipment from us, which is essentially a CO2 cylinder connector hose, on-off gun, and nozzles. Her unit had an optional filter on it. Uh, that's the basic unit. That's the simple concept. The nozzle she has works with both liquid and gas CO2 feed. It works with both. Most nozzles out there require only liquid CO2. And I think you have had a good experience with CO2 gas feed. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the CO2 gas is, is sort of the extraordinary, I mean, I don't know, I think you're the only person that produces a nozzle that can do yes. gas. I, tur I turned to gas because I was interested to see how fine you could get. Um, my nozzle as well will work with liquid. Um, and, it, you know, you, you get it, it's a different quality of, of snow that's produced. Um, and it's also, it, it changes the, the speed with which you go through a tank. Uh, a liquid tank with a dip tube, you're going to go through it pretty quick. I can give numbers on that. Liquid CO2 you consume eight times faster per unit time. With CO2 gas, the cleaning size is half the diameter, which means one fourth the area. So it's close to a washout in terms of speed versus consumption. Uh, CO2 gas is naturally cleaner than liquid. As for the accessory equipment, besides safety glasses and masks, I've, I have nothing to add. I, the, the one thing I would say that I didn't mention before that um, uh, I guess, you know, maybe too much time spent in front of speakers at concerts, but um, Susan uh, Edwards, who's, our or who's the technician here at the, at the Lunder Center, um, hearing protection, and Rosemarin clearly had hearing protection on, I mean, the jets can be quite loud. Um, now, I haven't used a MicroClean 3, but I'm sure if your compressor is anywhere near, you've got the sound of a compressor. Uh, a, the jet, um, you know, if you're sensitive to hearing, 
um, loud noises or con continuous loud noises, you, you probably want earplugs or something like that. I don't know. You probably don't need 95 decibel attenuation, but you know, plugs would do fine. Yeah. Yeah, one of the reasons I chose i3 was that it was less noisy than the bigger pellet machines, but it's still fairly noisy. Yeah. And CO2 snow cleaning, like what you and I used and Nancy mm. used, is quieter. Mm. But when you go to the low velocity method with CO2 snow, it gets to be noisy, but not as bad as pellets. One, one thing that Nancy mentioned, and this is again for the, for the safety thing about the, the dust mask, and I would say an N95 is probably all you really need. Um, when you're working in three dimension, you always have the potential for your your stream to come back at you if you hit a surface that's reflective, and it will come straight back at you if you're not careful. And sometimes you can't predict uh, really what's going to happen, so it's always good eye protection. To sort of, and if if you have a surface that you really think you might get blowback on, it's effective. Our next question. All here, right. And Thank then. you, Everett. Yeah, thank you everyone for a very informative session this morning. It's nice to see the, the range as well of, of uses. Uh, but I'll come back to silver in particular. Uh, so do you see uh, a potential maybe for the use of the CO2 snow as a, uh, as a way to remove protective coatings that were applied to silver or to copper alloys or to other metals? Um, I know you've mentioned so very much, Hugh, how it, it was effective at removal, at the removal of abrasive residues from uh, the cleaning process, but could you take it a step further to reduce the actual protective coating in, in terms, you know, in order to reapply a new one if necessary? I, I think specifically for snow, it really depends on the characteristics of the coating. Mm -hmm. I think what you're going to find in our afternoon session a lot more answers to those questions about coatings. Um, I think folks will find Siska's presentation interesting. I'm sure Julie has some things to add as well. Um, and again, it's, it's, you know, what are the parameters of the coating? What are you dealing with? You know, if it's a already a sort of compromised coating that um, between the combination of the solid particle and the jet that you can get under. And, and in reality, you know, if, if we would go back to my you know, teacher, Richard Wolvers, and say, okay, let's calculate what we're doing. If it's, you know, adhesive strength to the surface is lower than the sort of force that you can put onto it with the CO2 jet, then yeah, you've got a potential to cleave that. Um, if your coating is really cohesive and well adhered to the surface, um, not so much. And to add, it's really the key words. How well is that coating bonded to the surface? If there's any type of chemical interaction, it probably will stay. Otherwise, you have to rely upon a thermal mismatch to break it off. But, but you get a thermal mismatch by cooling it down. And you, you said thermal mismatch, but I, can you explain that more? Because we do expansion. remove most of these coatings it, with steam. So I, I, I would say that probably the best example is, is the one uh, that Rosemary gave where, you know, if you're heating, if you can heat that surface up and all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of like if you've ever been to a, a, a car company that removes um, hail damage where, you know, they sit your car out in the hot sun and then they drop really cold ice on it, and pop, the dent comes out. Mm -hmm. You're looking at that sort of response. Mm -hmm. Um, instantaneously, so you've got a, you, your reaction um, and the mechanics that are going on is really, I think, what Robert's trying to, mm -hmm. to say uh, well, in that instance. Yeah. Can I just add to that? So, because the metal doesn't expand as much as your layer, potentially because you're cooling it down, well, maybe to 10 degrees, it will shrink and therefore become brittle. But if, as Robert said, if it's very well bonded, you're basically taking a piece of sandpaper to the surface and trying to rub off the layer. So if it's not well bonded, I think it could be really, really successful. If it is well bonded, I'm convinced you will get some mechanical damage on the surface. Well, how about a question uh, on this side and then look back here. Hey, this sounds really exciting um, and I would like to use it, but can you talk about a comparison to just plain old compressed air? under certain okay. conditions? Okay, I see it. When you blow with compressed air, 
That's referred to as the aerodynamic drag force. Now, near the surface, you have what's called a dead zone. I think you refer to that. And the velocity decreases near a surface, so small particles cannot be removed with compressed air. What CO2 snow does is it adds a solid phase for momentum transfer. So compressed air works for loosely bound, larger stuff. If the contamination gets to be smaller, compressed air may fail. If, if you really want to sort of do a quick and dirty experiment for yourself, and again, you know, the manufacturers are completely off the hook for this, take a can of compressed air and use it normally as you would, and then flip it upside down and hit it, and what you'll get is actually CO2 snow, because most compressed air is carbon di dioxide. Um, and check out what it looks like in terms of the comparison to one to the other. Um, because you have that solid particle, you actually are able to really rem remove more material. And I think Nancy's slides um, showed some of that really well. You know, if, you, if a vacuum, which is think of compressed air in reverse, is unable to, to pull the particle up off the surface and you've got this, this sort of degree of control, but then you come to that surface with this sort of solid particle momentum transfer, and just looking at her images, you can tell the difference between the two and how much more clean things were even after um, the cleaning with the vacuum. It's sort of like the, the Japanese wa wakazashi sword that I showed and the handle. You know, I'd already vacuum cleaned it. I was like, you know, this thing's still really dirty. What am I going to do? Um, you know, the magic was in the solid particle. So I, I can just add that, you know, having gone through a lot of basketry fiber, um, both contemporary, historic, and archaeological, that the compressed air is, uh, as a technique for cleaning, is almost never acceptable because it just blows the surface fibers and anything that's a little bit loose and woven. It's just that force is just too much. I, I do see damage with that that's unacceptable and kind of uncontrollable. What's sort of fascinating when you work with the CO2 is that the particles move, but you don't get that same disruption of like, uh, you know, being in a wind tunnel. It's, it's, it, it's substantially different um, in, in the effect on the surface. So you're, you're able to kind of control and not just blow wildly. So most of the, most of the objects and the conditions I can imagine with literally tens of thousands of basketry type fibers woven um, would be unacceptable under compressed air. I would just add to that that, you know, what we're, Nancy and I are talking about is snow and, and so you're limited on the pressure because really it's, it's the back pressure in the tank. Um, which drops over time in use. Now, if you're talking about uh, solid CO2, like Rosemarin's speaking of, where you've got a scraped block, that's an entirely different story, um, you know, because you've got other variables there that you're really taking into account with. You're dialing in the amount of force that you're supplying by um, the airflow. And I was wondering, do you know how much softer the, the Carbon dioxide, snow particles are. I think so, Robert's probably <laughs> better to answer that than I. Well, am. solid dry ice, mm. like what you worked with, it's fully dense, 100% yeah. dense. CO2 snow is fluffy. Mm. Even when it's going at a high velocity and very small, it's fluffy. Mm. So it never has the impact to energy mm. as a pellet yeah. would. Okay. I want to add something about the pressure. A CO2 cylinder contains liquid CO2 always at room temperature in a lab. It'll be about 750 to 800 PSI. And the pressure is very dependent upon the temperature of your room. So if you take that cylinder and it's on the loading dock, uh, let's say on a winter day, you're going to open it up and see maybe 300 PSI, 400 PSI. So usually we recommend, we tell people to keep it in the lab and make sure it stays warm, otherwise you will lose pressure. Now, there's another trick to this, is that if you're using it a lot during the course of the day, as you gets consumed, the liquid goes down, it's going to want to evaporate inside the cylinder to restore pressure. That evaporation inside the cylinder is a cooling process, so the pressure is going to fall. It's going to cool off the cylinder, and, and the cylinder pressure will fall because that steel got cold. 
So if you use it a lot, right. you're going to see the pressure dropping. Then the next morning, it may be back up to pressure. Right, and, and you can feel your tank and, and, and see that happening. You know, I had referred to the, the unit in the Lunder Center as, as the Cadillac. Well, I didn't have the, the option to, uh, or didn't have the time to upgrade it to a Mercedes, which I was going to add um, actually a heater blanket to the cylinder so I could actually heat the blanket, heat the cylinder during process so I could actually boost uh, the, the tank back pressure. That's the Royals Royce. <laughs> well, and I, I have a little bit of an advantage in that most of, you know, over 90% of the objects I work on can fit on a counter or on a cart. You know, I, I don't have those enormous yeah. sculptures by and large. And so my working time between pieces is, is likely to be very short, um, mm -hmm. a couple seconds, really, um, or a minute. And then I might have to deal with the paperwork and go to the next. Um, so. Unless some, we're kind of in a production mode, you know, I, um, and I have noticed the difference. I didn't fully understand why I was seeing my tanks change on me, um, but there's a number of explanations, as I'm sure you're all getting, um, that you, you start learning, they teach you um, as you're working. But uh, I, there is an advantage to smaller, smaller objects you spend less time. Yeah. And Nancy's in a fortunate position being in Arizona that during the summer, not only is it dry, uh, she could put the cylinder outside during the day and she's going to land up with supercritical CO2, which will give a much larger stream and a lot more velocity. Okay, our next question. Uh, yes, uh, this is a question for uh, Robert Sherman. I'm wondering if you can uh, just give us a quick breakdown on the various types of nozzles. And the second question is, you talked a little bit about the solvent effect, I believe, of the liquid CO2. And I'm wondering if that might be a good technique for graffiti removal. Okay, I'll take the second one first. Graffiti removal, if it's a porous surface, CO2 snow is not good for porous surface. We'll get the stuff off the top, maybe, but I forget about the porosity. Uh, the example I show with the Sharpie is that took a little effort because I had to keep that surface warm. Graffiti removal is something that should be tested, but I'm not always optimistic about it. I mentioned in the talk that you can remove paint from surfaces, but that was a special application where a person out in California patented the process and it's expired. And but that took effort. And he tried to form a company to do that, which went under. Uh, I could give you the information on that patent later. Uh, now, the first question is different type of nozzles. I generally make, OK, I make a nozzle that works. The standard nozzle that they showed in the images works with liquid CO2 and CO2 gas feed. Uh, generally, nozzles require, most other nozzles from other companies require liquid CO2, and some of the other nozzles we work require liquid CO2. They're easier to make. To get the ge internal geometry on that one that does both takes an effort, and my machine shop loves me when I order nozzles because they're going to be busy. But uh, generally, the nozzle size is most are round nozzles. So the stream size for CO2 gas is down to two to three millimeters across. And with liquid CO2, it goes up to maybe six. We get sometimes increased diameters with different orifices on those non-adiabatic nozzles. Now, people, including myself, have taken nozzles and put them together on a manifold. But that has its own strange aerodynamic effects. It can be done, and I generally, there's so much push. If you put too many nozzles together in a short space, you're going to get pushback when you turn it on. I don't know if you ever felt it with a single nozzle, oh, yeah. but you yeah. put 10 nozzles together, you're feeling a pushback. Now, in the low velocity mode, we've been able to get it to two inches across, and we're trying to get someone to agree to help us make four inches across. But that's dusting, and that's going to be aimed initially at the telescope people never will work on graffiti. I think the pellet process may be better for the typical graffiti problem. I know the Dutch um, railway company used it to remove graffiti from their trains. They are removing pellets. it from quite a, a thick um, base yeah. layer of paint which is on the train. So. Sorry, um, the, the, I know the Dutch railways use dry ice blasting, but I don't know exactly which machine to remove graffiti off their trains. But I guess they're using the, the abrasive effects, but because they're underlaying paint layers so thick, they can get away with you know, removing the graffiti and going 
going down in the layers a little bit. I am still very intrigued by the the liquid CO2 on the surface. Uh, you you did speak about it, okay. it, it dissolving dry. hydrocarbons, but I, I'm okay. Just when not. the dry ice hits the surface, the snow mm -hmm. hits the surface, pressure rises, mm -hmm. and once that pressure exceeds 78 psi, it transforms from solid phase to liquid phase, mm -hmm. and liquid CO2 is a solid. But then, does it get enough time while it's liquid before it sublimates to do okay. something on the surface? Uh, if you have a normal fingerprint or facial yeah. grease, there's enough time. That little okay. video I showed shows how fast it is. Mm -hmm. It's a surprisingly fast, mm -hmm. but if you have an object the size of this table, it's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. But if you have a small object for uh, fingerprint or facial grease removal, mm -hmm. it's quick. But is it a liquid, or is it the particle hitting the grease, which has cooled down, so it's become quite hard, and mm. then it's being no, pushed off? No, it the becomes surface. a liquid. We believe it's a liquid because mm -hmm. the speed, when we try to take off a, a silicone oil, similar, very thin layer, mm -hmm. it's a much slower process. So That means that the so hot facial grease is being removed quicker. Yeah. And facial grease is predominantly a hydrocarbon. Yeah. While silicone okay. oil, okay. not soluble in liquid CO2. I could give you a reference later mm -hmm. on that discusses in much greater detail. Be interesting. I see one microphone in the center at the back. We'll take that first and then back to the right side. Thanks. Hi, my question is in regard to rosemarin. And it has to do with, especially with your cold jet unit. Um, did you have any concern over moisture or oil from your compressor getting into your airline and affecting the, uh, the uh, effectiveness of having that mix with the ice when you're blasting? Um, the moisture condensation, you mean? Just from the normal use of the compressor, just if your normal ambient air being pulled in isn't fully dried, are you sending moisture in uh -huh. your airline yeah. in with the dust or the shaving? I have to say, I do not know because I was using the setup from the, um, the CO2 plant that they had there. It may well have been dried compressed air. I didn't see much condensation though. I did try to also create condensation on the smaller objects that was possible. On most of my samples, I didn't see any uh, moisture. Because as I understand, well, yeah. as I understand it, yeah. there's a possibility yeah. that there if there's be. moisture coming through, if say, because in, in Virginia, we've experimented with dry ice and we have a huge amount of humidity. Mm -hmm. And what it was explained to me is that the, when the moisture gets pulled in, it'll actually coat the CO2 dust with a layer of water, and then you're actually hitting your object with ice mm -hmm. and not CO2 by itself. And that could affect your working parameters. I see, I see Julie Wolf I about to jump out of her seat. She probably has an answer <laughs> to that. Can somebody get Julie a microphone? <laughs> yeah. She'll go ahead and answer it. So, um, I'm, hi, this is Julie Wolf. And the answer is yes. So, you have to filtrate your mm -hmm. airline. And um, a lot of the um, compressed air units that if we rent them, um, they come with uh, mm -hmm. filtration added to them. So you do need to filter out oils and water. And it's not only um, going to complicate the cleaning action, but also it's not good for the instruments to have the water going through them as well. Mm -hmm. so. I think the companies like Coljet require you to have filters mm -hmm. on your compressed air lines to avoid that problem. They do, mm -hmm. yeah. Probably why I didn't consider it at all. At least I don't remember <laughs> because it was all. Plan, the physical plan yeah, they would have had would that. Have that they too. Would they should yeah, have yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Our next question here on the right. Um, yeah, I have a question for Nancy. Um, it was about the solvency action that we are talking about with, uh, with the CO2. I was wondering if you were worried about the effects of some of the components of the plant and basketry material, like whether you're moving anything or, or um, you know, solubilizing anything out, like whether you've seen dryness or brittleness or anything happen when you clean the baskets? Well, the short answer is, is no. So that was part of the reason to do this fairly elaborate, yeah. like, study to sort of prove to myself what, what I thought I was seeing. Um, so no, I, I really haven't seen that. And I, I would have categorically said things like grimy dirt, you know, and hand dirt uh, that we, that kind of soiling. 
I, I don't have very much luck with that. I can have it reduced, um, and people have sent me samples that have had that, but generally if that kind of soiling has occurred on top of dry soiling, like a dusty object gets handled or something, then, then yes, you're kind of going into the dry and getting it off. But in general, the soiling there, as far as like general plant material, I mean, we, we or, or just objects, I mean, we have a lot of non-cataloged things. I borrowed some things from the education department. I mean, we were just for a long time just kind of playing with this to sort of see. So observationally, no, and we were looking for that kind of thing, as well as like the displacement um, of just structure where something is, you know, thread or fiber in alignment, how much disruption was that? It's, it, it's really amazing how gentle it is. microphone in uh, the back. Um, following on that same topic, uh, in discussing the hydrocarbons, you were talking about facial oils and fingerprint oils, but what about heavier, I mean, literally, you know, you see monuments that have been splashed with engine oil. Uh, would the solvent effect have effect on something as heavy as a, as a petroleum lubricant? Or is that too heavy a material to, to be solubilized? I have removed heavier oils from surfaces, but I've been working on silicon wafers as test samples with that. If it gets to be too much, it probably is too much. I know that's not a good quantitative answer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, I have, you know, when I did that demo, I would rub my forehead and smear it on a wafer. That's pretty heavy. Would, would it have any effect on perhaps thinner layers of hardening oils? like tongue oils or the, the penetrol that we sometimes apply to steels? Uh, this, is, this is Jim Gwinner. Um, I'm going to go through that in my talk, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't know the chemistry of those oils, I'm sorry. In, but it's, uh, it's very effective at removing oil and wax. And, uh, oh, you're doing pellets, right? Some, some of it, I would, I would say, both the question of graffiti and oils for monuments, again, is this the sort of topic I tried to raise is we're talking about scale. So you've got, to, you've got to match your scale to what, what it is you're trying to do. And I think probably both Sis, Siska and Jim uh, will get into that as well as Julie because we're, we're moving up in scale as we go through the day. Um, and I think you'll see some interesting stuff come out uh, later in the afternoon. I would say if it's a small object, try snow. Send me a sample. <laughs> I've a taken three and one oil off of a wafer. Next question here in the front. This is, again, a, a question specifically for the snow cleaning. You've talked about, and clearly here in this museum, engineered a system to um, proactively counter potentially negative effects of static and uh, temperature variation and condensation. Can you talk about, have you observed any, any of those negative effects on any surfaces? And can you just share some anecdotal evidence of problematic experiences you've had? Oh, sure. Um, you know, glass, um, things that are really thermally conductive, and you can think of that in, a, in sort of the classic um, terms that we think of in conservation, so anything that's going to hold heat or anything that's going to hold cold. Um, I would be incredibly wary of, of, without taking precaution, of trying to clean something that is a, a steel alloy um, that's really more of a carbon steel, so you're going to have the concern about um, rusting, because you really will bring moisture to the surface. And, you know, it doesn't have to be as sophisticated as what, what is upstairs with the unit in the Lunder Center. It can be a hot air gun. Um, and I've used that. Sometimes that's what it calls for. Um, I haven't ha necessarily had any disastrous, um, mainly because it's always in the back of my head that this is a potential the, um, variable that I have to control. But there are definite um, instances where I've used it and I'm like, oh, well, you know, that was, you know, I'm an idiot. I should have turned on the nitrogen because I'm getting too much moisture. And in that instance, you know, what you also have to remember is it's not just um, protecting the object from the condensation of the moisture, but, you know, you're not cleaning efficiently because water is, is getting, going to get in the way of your snow and you're just, you know, it, it's like trying to shoot pool underwater. You just not, your dynamics are not the same, so. Uh, on a steel object, uh, if it's a reasonable mass, you probably will not see moisture condensation because it has 
It's not a correct term, thermal mass. It's when the combination of lack of thermal mass and lack of thermal conductivity that those samples will have the greatest risk of moisture condensation, like the polymer that you demonstrate cleaning on. There, that will freeze up instantly unless you had a blanketing gas. Uh, so generally, metals are pretty easy and the water absorbs can be taken off really quickly. Because even if you don't have a blanketing gas on a sample without thermal mass, what you could do is let's say you're cleaning something that's flat like this table, and you're cleaning like this, you just take the gun and aim it parallel to the surface. That fast moving gas will cause evaporation to occur. And, and you can even back off of the surface. Yes. So, I mean, wow. and that's what I was talking about. You know, you think of it as controlling your dew point. And remember, at the end of, end of that blast, you've got a different temperature than what your surrounding temperature is. So it's just like whenever you have weather. You know, if you ram a, a cold air mass into a warm air mass, no matter what the humidity is, you're going to get precipitation. Where I could see potential problems, particularly even in metals, is if, for example, and I, and I actually, thinking about what Nancy's done and, and just sort of limitations that often occur on site, I, I think snow would be an incredible tool for archaeological digs. Um, but I would also, you know, throw a word of caution out there that if you've got something that's a corrosion product that's particularly active with condensation of moisture, that's something you're really going to want to think about how do you counteract that, whether it's you put, you put your metal object on a hot plate or in a warming situation, heat lamps, whatever, but the things that you would worry about normally with condensation or moisture are the same things you'd need to worry about whenever you're using snow. Well, and I, I just thought I, all that's really true. You can kind of modify your work area, you yeah. know, in terms of, you know, the ambient temperature a little bit and, you know, where the objects are. We uh, had thought about in terms of just, you know, even having a, like the area, the items I was going to use have a little heating pad over there just to kind of keep them not not heating them but just heating the area that where they were sitting as a as a way to kind of improve because what what you can see when you're working you you're right there you're not in another room I mean you're you can you can read your jet very well and so if if ice is little ice crystals are forming or if something looks wet, you, you can see it right away and, and you can react. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can do all kinds of things. You can move the object, you can pull it back, you can, you have a lot of control. Mm -hmm. So just, it's very mechanic, in that way, it's, it's very mechanical treatment. You, you, the operator's critical to where mm -hmm. and how you're going. That's why it was in my presentation twice. <laughs> <laughs> it's very user dependent and you learn. But Robert, yeah. you also mentioned that metals actually, because they transport heat, uh, cold and yes. heat so quickly, if your object is not that small, it's going to transport the cold and it's actually not going to cool down as quick. Is that correct? It's not going to cool it down as quickly as other surfaces. Yeah. Or you go to Arizona on a nice yeah. warm sunny day. <laughs> Or Denver was another great well, location. Well, even an air, you know, like an over air conditioned room. I mean, it just needs to have that dryness. We just always have dryness. Benefit from it. <laughs> yeah. exactly. So we have time for one or two more questions. I know we have one at the back. Yeah. Hi, this is Siska. I have a question for Nan Nancy. Nancy, uh, I was wondering what your experience was with the matte paint that you uh, cleaned, because that was really interesting to me that you went over. I did. And uh, it didn't budge at all. No. I mean, and we did a couple things. Now, I haven't done a, a really serious testing because it's a little, it was the use of matte paints in basketry is known, but it's not particularly common. So yeah. um, the number of examples and, you know, we're, it, I can think of a zillion things I'd love to test, but, you know, there's the job of getting things <laughs> done. Um, so the number of examples would be a fairly small sample, but we were really concerned about these these large, I mean, they can be this big to wider than this, these items that use a lot of um, actually laundry bluing and uh, dry hematite would be the pigment base of, uh, so it's synthetic ultramarine with a tiny bit of starch. And so those would be the ones that I had spent more time with, but we didn't have a displacement. Um, we kind of held, paper and you know we were looking at it closely so it was visual 
I didn't yeah. do a, a measured study, but it yeah. was that was fine. Interesting. Thank you. So that's interesting that you know other people are you know removing paint. Yeah. It's all that. It's the degree. One more question. Oh, thank you. I have a question. About 15 years ago, I saw a demonstration of dry ice cleaning on soiled marble, and there was a considerable change in surface texture following the cleaning. And I have no idea what the apparatus was, or the size of the pellets, or the, the little pieces of dry ice. And I'm wondering if you could comment on perhaps what I was seeing 15 years ago, and if it's the same, perhaps the same apparatus that would be available today or not, or um, yeah, I'm asking an impossible <laughs> question. question. Was it loud? Yes. Then it was probably pellets. I think it yeah. was pellets. <laughs> yes, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, it wasn't snow. It was pellets. pellets. Yeah. And I think in 15 years, the basic concept haven't changed. Maybe the equipment has been improved. And you may have more control than 15 years ago. It will change the texture. Yeah, no, it wasn't sugaring, but it's pretty easy to make marble sugar if you want it to. Okay, th there's, there's ways uh, which perhaps I can get to in my talk, but you, you can actually reduce the pressure and reduce the pellet size uh, where you may not get that effect. Okay, thank you. And just to add to that also, um, there is a, um, a, a greater range of instruments um, now than 15 years ago. And so there's a lot of different um, kind of applications. And so I think um, a lot of fine tuning of the instruments and they're improving more and more. So you're also gonna see a change in that as well. Can I add something? Sure. There's a, between pellets, CO2 pellets and CO2 snow, there's a gap. And that gap exists because of the density of the materials that are striking the surface. And if someone could figure out how to get that gap narrower, there could be many more applications because snow is very, is gentle in comparison mm. to pellets. Do you, do you not think it's that shaved block ice it's machine It's still is fully type? dense. Okay. It, yeah, it's still fully dense. CO2 is not destructive because essentially it's limited to 78 mm. PSI on the surface. Then it goes liquid. Pellets, you could blast it. <laughs> Can I just make one comment? Sorry, the last thing is there's a, a new machine by Coaljet called the SDI Select 60, which actually shaves the pellets. So you get a little aggregate that's sort of in between pellets and in between the dust. So it's sort of, it's a mid-sized aggregate. We'll be hearing about that this yeah, afternoon. So. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.